Hello! Welcome to the Math 135 video for sketching the graph of the function 1 over 1 plus x squared. The intensity of this video is medium. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. The learning objectives for this video are, by the end of this video, you should be able to sketch a rational function using derivatives, and you should be able to identify when a graph does not have a given property. Note that I'll be assuming that you have seen an example of how to sketch a function before using derivatives, so we won't go over in detail how all of these things are related, but we will go over through this example um, slowly. So our motivation is how can we sketch the function 1 over 1 plus x squared using information about its derivatives? Our plan is as follows. If f of x is the function 1 over 1 plus x squared, we're going to start by investigating f. So this means find the domain of it, find the y-intercept of f, find the roots of f, find where f is positive and negative. We'll investigate the symmetry of f, meaning is it even or odd or neither. And then we'll find the end behavior of f. Note that all of this stuff is going to be used uh, or is going to be discovered and investigated just from f itself without derivatives. Once we've exhausted all of that, then we'll actually look at the derivative of f. So then we'll look at where is f prime positive, negative, or zero, which will tell us where f is increasing or decreasing. And then we'll use the first derivative test to see where f has local maxes and mins. Finally, once we're finished with f prime, we'll move on to f double prime, the second derivative of f. We'll figure out where f double prime is positive or negative, which will tell us about when f is concave up or down, and then we'll find any inflection points. All right, so that's our strategy. Do as much as we can with f, then do as much as we can with f prime, then finish off by working with f double prime. So here's our function, and we're first going to look at the domain. Well, since you're never dividing by zero, since the denominator is never zero, this means that the domain is all real numbers. For the y-intercept, we plug in x equals 0, and we get 1. So we know that it crosses uh, the y-axis at x equal, sorry, at y equals 1. The roots, so where is this function 0? Well, this has no solutions, because if you started with the assumption that the function was 0, cross-multiplying would give you 1 equals 0, which is nonsense. The denominator is always positive, so the function is always positive. So this function is just always positive. What about symmetry? If you plug in minus x, then what you see is that the minus x squared simplifies to x squared, so that's just the original function. If f of minus x is equal to f of x, this means that f is even, so it has symmetry about the y-axis. Finally, we'll look at end behavior. So if you look at the limit as x goes to infinity or minus infinity, in both cases it's 0. It's 1 over a very, very large number, which will be 0. OK, so let's gather up all of those observations. So the domain of f is all real numbers. The y-intercept is 1. It has no roots. It's always positive. It's even. And its horizontal asymptotes are y equals 0. So that's what we know so far from just looking at f. So let's do a simple exercise. Here are three potential um, graphs of this function. Now, from what we know already, I want you to give a reason why these three graphs are not the graph we're looking for. So take a moment, pause the video, and look for the reasons why these three aren't the graphs we're looking for. OK, welcome back. So let's look at this first one right here. Its domain appears to be all real numbers. The y-intercept is 1. That's good. But our function has no roots. This one has two roots. Our function is always positive. This one's negative sometimes. This function is even. And it's hard to tell what the horizontal asymptotes are, but it doesn't look like they're going to 1. They're going to 0. So there's lots of reasons why this one doesn't work. What about our second one? Again, the domain appears to be all real numbers. The y-intercept is 1. Yeah, that looks right. No roots. Yeah, this one doesn't look like it has any roots. It's always positive. 
it's even, so so far it's doing pretty good, but are its horizontal asymptotes y equals zero? Well, no, this looks like it's just gonna, the horizontal asymptotes are gonna be one. Okay, so this was pretty close, but not quite. And then for the last one, again, its domain appears to be all real numbers. The y-intercept is one again. It has no roots. It's not crossing the x-axis. It is always positive. It isn't even. So here there's no symmetry about the y-axis. So that's one reason. What are its horizontal asymptotes? It's kind of hard to tell. This one, it looks like it's going to zero, so that's fine. But this one, it looks like it's going off to infinity. So here it's got the, a wrong horizontal asymptote on the right-hand side. This type of skill of knowing when your picture is wrong um, can be very helpful in avoiding mistakes. All right, now we're finished up with f. Let's move on to f prime. So now we need to look at the derivative and let's compute the derivative. We're gonna use the quotient rule. So the quotient rule gives us this. We have the derivative of one here, which is gonna simplify to just zero. And then the derivative of one plus x squared will be two x. So this one's actually not too hard. Now our next question is, where is this derivative equal to zero? Well, let's look at the denominator. When is the denominator zero? And where is the denominator um, uh, zero? The denominator is always positive because one plus x squared is always positive. So when you square that, it stays positive. So this whole function can be zero only when the numerator is zero. So the only possibility is that minus two x is zero. So in other words, x is equal to zero. Okay, now let's take this information and figure out when is our function positive and negative. So we make a sign diagram for f prime. So we indicate all of the places where the derivative is zero, and then to the left of zero, we need to figure out is the derivative positive or negative, and same with to the right. So if we take a sample point like minus one, what happens when you plug in x equals minus one here? The denominator is always positive, and so the numerator becomes positive. Minus two times minus one is plus two. Similarly, if you take a point over here like x equals three, if you plug x equals three in here, you get negative over positive. So there's our sine diagram. What does this tell us about the original function? Well, when the derivative is positive, it means the function, the original function is increasing. And when the derivative is negative, it means our original function is decreasing. So there we go. We can extract information about the original function. What does this tell us about maxes and mins? Well, here we have increasing, decreasing, so it looks like there we have a max, a local max. So by the first derivative test, f has a local max at x equals zero. And because our function is just always increasing here and then always decreasing, this has to be an absolute max. There's no other place that can be bigger than it. Okay, now we're done with f prime. Let's move on to f double prime. So now we need to compute the second derivative of this and this one's going to be a little bit more annoying. So here we have to use the quotient rule and it's not as nice. So we use the quotient rule. Computing the derivative of minus two x is not hard. Computing the derivative of one plus x squared squared involves the chain rule twice. So this is two times one plus x squared times the derivative of one plus x squared, which is two x. Here we cancel these minus signs. And now we have a big old mess. And we'd like to simplify this a little bit so that we can eventually factor the numerator and the denominator. We have a one plus x squared here and here, so let's cancel one of them. So we canceled one of these one plus x squareds, and then we combined two x two and two x to x squared, eight x squared. We canceled one of the one plus x squareds here. Now we combine the things on the numerator. This is almost good. Uh, we want to factor the numerator. So you can play around with this. You can notice that this is kind of a difference of squares. You end up with something like this. 
All right, so now we can figure out where is our second derivative positive and negative. Well, here we need to look at the roots, which will be 1 over root 3 and minus 1 over root 3. Again, taking sample points like 0, minus 1, and 1 can tell us where this second derivative is positive or negative. I'll let you do this on your own, but it's going to be positive, negative, positive. Okay, now what does this tell us about our original function? So whenever the second derivative is positive, our function is concave up. So it's concave up on these two intervals. And wherever the second derivative is negative, our original function is concave down. Great. Inflection points happen where the, the derivative, sorry, the sign of the second derivative changes and the original function is defined. So here we have an inflection point and here we have an inflection point. All right, bringing it all together, this is all of the information we have. So these first six are about our function um, that we just got from the function itself. These two we got from the first derivative, and these two we got from the second derivative. Let's take all of this information and put it together to draw it. Take a moment to do this right now. All right, so let's see what I got. The first thing I'm going to start with is the uh, horizontal asymptotes. So I know that my function is going to eventually go to zero, and it's always going to be positive. So what are the ways to do that? Well, it has to look something like this. I don't know exactly yet, but it's going to look something like this. And our function is even, so whatever I do on the left-hand side, I also have to do on the right-hand side. Now I need to figure out what's happening in the middle here. So why don't I look at the y-intercept? I know that the y-intercept is one, so there's gonna be a point right here. And then what's happening around this point? Well, we can see that our function is concave uh, up, um, sorry, concave down on that interval. So the function is gonna be sort of looking down. So let's draw that. We also know that this is a local max, so that works out nicely. That's, that's what we expected. So f has a local max at x equals 0. Now we just have to figure out how to connect these things. Well, we can look at the concave up part. We know that on this side, um, it's going to be concave up until we get to this point, and then it's going to go concave down. So really, like just connecting these, you're going to, will will do everything you need. And then we can check that it's increasing on this range and decreasing on this range. All right, there's our function. All right, here's some other exercises for you. Sketch the graph of f of x equals one over one plus x cubed. Indicate all relevant features. So we mean intercepts, critical points, inflection points, local and absolute maxes and mins, and end behavior. Also sketch the graph of the function one over one minus x squared. Take a moment to reflect. Is it possible for an increasing function to change from concave up to concave down and then back to concave up one after another? Thank you very much and have a great day.